Hi, this is Jack Lifton, and, and today uh, Byron King and I are going to be speaking with Jeff Atkins, uh, the CEO of Vital Metals of Australia, about Vital's future in the in, in the wireless market. Uh, good evening, Jeff, uh, or is it good morning? <laughs> oh, it's, a, yeah, it's early morning, early morning. Hi, Jack. Hi, Byron. How are you? Very well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, in, in a recent uh, investor talk, you, you, you made the point that your target production in, in your facility, which is building in Saskatoon, is 2,000 tons a year of total wear earth. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. So with, with the product we have coming out of Natural Art Show, that product will, that includes about 500 tonne of uh, knee denim pressed in. That, that's 25%. That's a pretty rich material. It is. Uh, uh, quite frankly, I've never heard of bastocyte that had that level of neodymium uh, and praseodymium. So uh, that's very good because it's enough to produce about almost 2,000 tons of earth permanent magnets, which is quite a bit. Yeah, look, and, and that's the, the thing with the North Tea project and actually Natural Art Show itself with the bastocyte, mm -hmm. which we have up there. It really is a unique a unique deposit which offers you know a large number of um of benefits and uh over over other projects which we looked at i think that uh, you you also said before you have about a hundred thousand tons of this material yes so um over with the initial pit that we have there was about a hundred thousand the ore re um resource is about a hundred thousand tons at near enough to, to ten percent rare earths I'm going to put you on the spot for a second and ask a question you probably don't want to answer. Have you been contacted by any automotive uh, plant companies, either manufacturers of cars or their or the parts for them? We've had conversations with a number of groups through all elements of the um, of the of the magnet supply chain. So obviously, the nature of those conversations is uh, is confidential. But look, okay. we have we have a number of conversations with. Um, yeah, with a variety of companies through that supply chain. You're you're going to be sending the, the output of your Saskatoon plant, which I understand will be mixed where of carbonate solids, yes. uh, to a Norwegian company, which is buying them. And since Norway does not assemble cars or make parts for cars, I assume Retech has some customers in mind. That, that that's will. correct. So, so our... Our offtake agreements, we have a binding offtake agreement with Retech up in Norway, and then we're currently working through the definitive agreement with uh, with UCOR in the US. Okay, thank you. Uh, Byron, yeah. over to you. Well, well thank you. Uh, and it's uh, Jeff, it's a pleasure to speak with you. Uh, since we're talking to, a, you know, to an investment-oriented audience here, uh, we were speaking earlier, and I'd like you to expand again, you know, for the people who didn't hear it the first time, on what you perceive as the difference between a small, uh, you know, sort of niche, and that might not be the right word, market, you know, for the, the specialty metals versus what other people think is big mining, you know, and then, uh, you know, if I'm mining copper, I can sell my copper to, you know, tens of thousands of people. If I mine gold, everybody loves gold, they're all going to buy my gold. If I'm trying to do this rare earth thing, what tell, tell me tell, expand a little more on the differences of what you were discussing earlier, please. Yeah, the biggest difference is really when you look at who your customer is and the process which your customer uses. So, if you look at a, a base commodity, whether it be copper, iron, ore, something like that, effectively you can sell your product to just about anybody, and they all follow the same process. So there's a lot of changeability between customers. Um, with especially materials such as rare earths, because every single deposit is so different and has very different uh, impurities in it, and because the final product has to be, has to have such high uh, or very tight specifications, the customer acceptance process is very long and it, and it is a, a, a complicated process. But also the other thing is you have a you build a real relationship with your customers and you have to work together um, as you go through and su supply them the products. So 
what it means is that you can't just build and produce a large amount of product on day one and expect to sell it because there's not going to be any plants which are able to actually take your product. If your customer doesn't have their facility specifically tuned to your product, they're not going to produce product at specification. And when you start talking about materials where you have one part per million of insensitivity or you know, higher, um, that's where uh, substitution and things like that become very difficult. And it's where end users are very particular around making sure that they need to have a guarantee of the quality of their product that it's going to produce, it's going to uh, act in the way that it, that, it, that it needs to. I mean, if you look at a car manufacturer, for example, who's building a, you know, an electric vehicle where you have the electric motor, which has a rated power output and efficiency, they need to have absolute confidence that at every step along the supply chain, it's going to perform the way that it's been designed to. Now, if the performance of that motor depends on one part per million or two parts per million of an impurity level at the mine site, that helps explain that customer acceptance, the importance of that customer acceptance protocol. And that's something which you don't have in iron ore, copper, or anything like that, where you're talking about percentage points mm -hmm. with impurities. In, in the 2011 boomlet for rare earths, as, as I interviewed the company founders, every one of them would tell me our product is going to be a mixed con. And, and I would say, and who is the customer? Well, it doesn't matter. You know, it, it, it's something in demand and probably the Chinese and they're going to pay us X percentage of, of the contained material. And, and I remember realizing that their hopes were way over reality. It, yeah. it, and, and so nobody ever produced that mixed con in that period, no one. And, and so it, it, it all failed. And if they had, I knew, for, I was traveling in China at that time, that, that the Chinese refiner would pay at most 40, 45% of contained FOB China. Okay, yeah. so these guys, now, as you mentioned, Jeff, the world has changed the rare earth world in particular. And so now I, now I really think we're approaching a seller's market. And, and yeah. so you're, you're, at the, you're in the right business at the right time. Yeah. And I, I think there's a couple of things which have really changed. One is China is now a net importer of rare mm -hmm. earths. And whereas back in 2011, they're a net exporter. So there wasn't one for one thing for selling mixed rare earth carbon. If you're selling mixed rare earth carbonates, there wasn't that real demand in China. So right. It, right. It, it was definitely a buyer's market. The second thing was that one thing you're seeing now is there's a real push for independent separation facilities outside of China. So if you're looking in Europe, you're looking in, um, in North America, there's a number of independent separation facilities and there's also a real push from government, uh, governments around the world for the establishment of these, uh, these refineries, magnet manufacturing, which means that all of a sudden, it's not, they're not available today, but over the next three, four, five years, you're going to start to see more of these separation facilities start to be developed, which for us means that for our business model, it's really about guaranteeing the supply of feedstock to those facilities because the more of those facilities which are built each one of them is going to need feedstock and the difficulties in having a fully integrated supply chain all the way through from mine right through to separation and then magnets when you're talking about such different technologies and different processes inherently that brings far greater risks. So I think you'll see more companies move away from that and focus on one or the other. And our focus is obviously on the supply of that feedstock. Byron? Yeah, great, great points, Jeff. Thank you so much. Uh, I wanna get back to something else that we were talking earlier. And again, it, it, and since, we're, since people are watching this who are from the 
investing side and you know, a mining investing side. I want to reemphasize the difference between you know what we would call you know big mining versus you know the specialty metal mining. And like if, if I'm mining copper, you know I want a big deposit. I want a big mine. I want a big mill. I want a big I want a big everything. Even if it's really high grade stuff, this is a beautiful specimen of cuprite, for example. Can't get can't get better mineral ore from the ground than cuprite. This is mostly copper, a few other odds and ends from Dalnagorsk, Russia, you know. And then this is the end product. Here's a nice little chunk of copper, you know, from a copper refinery. This this isn't pure copper. It's got a bunch of crud in it, you know, but that's okay for copper. But why is why why can't why can't I I apply the copper model to your rare earths? Tell, tell, explain 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 why you need a certain different um, approach to what you're doing. Yeah. So I think the biggest one is when you think about the time it takes from starting building a plant to actually having your customers accept your full production. So if you look at a typical copper project, you build your plant, you ramp it up. Fundamentally, the product coming out of it will be at specification as you ramp up. You just the throughputs recoveries aren't going to quite um, match up until you hit, to name, hit nameplate, which in a copper typical prop, copper project, you might be looking at nine months, something to 12 months, say. Rare earths is very different. When you ramp up your project, you're not only trying to get recoveries, you're trying to get um, throughputs, you're also trying to get specifications. So that ramp up, process is going to take minimum two years, just off straight off the bat. Now, after you manage to get and produce product at specification, you then have to send that product to your customers to go through your acceptance protocols. You can't do it before you hit specification, you've got to do it after. And then your customers will then start their acceptance protocols. So they will gradually start to increase the amount of product that they accept over a period of time. So that might take another year, two years to go through that. So then all of a sudden you're at a point where if you've built a large plant, say I've spent a billion dollars on a rare earth plant, which has a capacity of 20,000 tonnes, you're then looking at another four years fundamentally before you're actually getting full return on that. Now that's a lot of money to spend on a plant which is sitting there not getting a return. And then think about the working capital which you have to spend during those four years when you're not getting a full return. So that leads to, and this is, you know, if you look at the history of rare earth projects from you know, 20, 2010, 2011, that's fundamentally what happened where these companies you, know, you start running out of working capital, you need to go back to the market, and as you go back to the market, your investors are getting further and further diluted. Mm -hmm. So you don't get those same returns to your shareholders. So the approach which we're taking is saying, okay, instead of going for that big plant on day one, we're actually going to scale our project at the very start based on what our customers will accept for their acceptance protocols. So we reduce the timelines and straight away, everything we're producing is able to be sold. And okay. then as the, customer, as the customer wants to accept more product, we can then build and expand our plant to feed into that then. But it means that our shareholders aren't being diluted through and the funding of, those, of that expansion occurs during through cash flow. Thank, thank you, Jeff. You, you've actually... Uh, articulated exactly what I think uh, Byron, the answer what Byron wanted. Uh, and I just, we're going to close this with just one little story that I have. I can tell you from personal experience of decades that the automotive industry takes three years for PPAP, production part approval process. And they don't like the military way of saying, well, this is, this is similar to a three-year test. They give it a three-year test. So you're absolutely right about, about the timelines. Look, Jeff, we'd like to stay in touch with you. And, absolutely. And do, do this as reasonably frequently because I think you're moving very fast and I think you're ahead 
of the pack. So good yep. luck and thank, thank you, you very much uh, for your time. Uh, th thank you, Jack. Thanks, Byron. I appreciate your time.